wait a minute. What? What? We stuffing kids into the ant? Time out. Into Chuck E. Cheese animals? We stuffing ki dead kids in it? Bro, what are we doing? <laughs> Welcome back, it's your boy, Be The Critter. We'll sit down for more time. It's about to get back into another reaction video. Let's stop what we're doing and let's get into something that I've seen on YouTube. Uh, five Nights at Freddy's. It's like some bears that like losing eyes, got a little bit of their arms taken off. What it looks like is Chuck E. Cheese when an atomic bomb hit it. And that's what happened to the characters. It's just like a zombie apocalypse for teddy bears are kid friendly toys i'm not really sure let's just go ahead and get into it i see it on the internet i don't even know what it is game theory f n a f the ultimate timeline i don't even know and the torment 19 books 11 games eight whole years all leading to this moment the ultimate fnaf timeline is finally complete the pieces are in place for us now all we have to do is put this story of tragedy jealousy and loss back together What? I have no idea. I, I never Hello, heard Internet! Welcome to Just Game on the Theory, the show that feels like a kid revealing the class project that he's been working on all year. Except here, it's the class project that I've been working on for the past decade of my life. This one is big, my friends, and I gotta admit, kinda nervous. I haven't attempted a timeline video on this franchise since 2018. Back in the days when Mike was the crying child, Afton coming back was actually a surprise, and Fazgu wasn't a phrase I'd ever thought I'd have to utter. But since the last time I did something like this, we've had three more massive hell? games, the death and revival of the FNAF movie, and more robot kids than you can shake a staff bot at. It is exhausting trying to keep track of this whole franchise, which honestly is why I'm here today. The lore at this point is complicated. It is full of speculation and theory, so to hopefully make it a little easier for everyone and to give us I'm a little baseline already. to talk about this franchise moving forward into the future, it's time to reveal my current working FNAF timeline. But just before I do, I just want to explain a couple of things. First, this timeline is massive. Seriously, it is huge. This thing towers over any video project we have ever done on the channel. But when you look at the totality of this franchise, the story of FNAF really boils down to the story of one man, William Afton. His successes, his failures, his rise to becoming co-owner of one of the most successful restaurant franchises in the world, and his eventual fall to the monsters he helped to create, only to then be reborn in a new digital form later. That's why I've decided to split this what? timeline into three main chunks. The foundation of Freddy's, how the business started and how it came into being, the Afton oh, era, place. William's decades-long murder spree, and post-Purple Guy. Basically, modern FNAF. Everything that happens after the pizzeria simulator fire. And because there are lots of new big revelations in this thing that seemingly come out of nowhere, as well as just points I want to talk about further, I decided to dedicate one episode to each chunk. I originally wanted it to be one seamless, continuous video, but it just felt incomplete without some sort of explanation at the end of each one. Once this whole thing's done, I promise I'm going to merge all the narrative bits into one massive video so you can just skip my explanations. Uh, but for now, okay. this just felt like the best, most satisfying, most complete way to do this. That being said, this is still about the story, the broad strokes of the franchise. So in order to make sure that you guys know that I'm not just pulling answers out of thin air, not only am I discussing some of the more controversial bits at the end of each chunk, we're also putting in a handy little graphic in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, which will show thumbnails, video titles, books, and any other citations that we need throughout the video. So well, if you wish to understand deal. that specific specific statement in more detail, you know exactly where we've taken it from. That way you can Books look at those everything. details yeah. for yourself. So sit Movie back, grab out. some popcorn or your pitchforks if you're the type to get upset when I say something controversial, and make sure that you subscribe since this is going to be a video that you're going to want to come back to a few times in order to fully dissect. Without any more waiting, I present to you the story of a loving, obsessive father who slowly descended into madness and along the way discovered the secret to eternal life. <laughs> Our story begins not in the 1980s, or even in the 1970s, but all the way back in the 1930s. It was the throes of the Great Depression, and people were in desperate need of cheap entertainment, especially in Utah, one of the states hit hardest, fourth highest unemployment in the nation, and full of transients. People looking for work in Salt Lake, finding none, and ultimately moving on to find their fortunes out in California. People were tired, and they on, were dog? hungry, but as they traveled, there was one thing that could lift their spirits. A simple roadside attraction called Fred Bear's Singin' Show. 
The ads were plastered all over town, featuring an animated bear drawn in the popular pie-eyed cartoon style for characters at the time. He resembled cartoons like Mickey Mouse, Felix the Cat, Betty Boop. It immediately said that this, Fred Bears, was a place where you could bring the family. And the price? Honestly, couldn't be beat. For 50 cents, you could get food and entertainment as you watched the local a trained real-life dancing me, bear perform on stage. Like, no Normally, you only got to see dancing bears at large traveling circuses what? like Barnum and Bailey, where the tickets would go for about a dollar. That's a dollar without food. But this was a smaller show, like the type from the Vaughn Brothers or the Robbins Brothers, where tickets would sell for just a mere 50 cents. Watching that bear do tricks yeah. on stage Did brought a glimmer of joy at a time when so much was wrong with the world. The simple show would go on for years, bringing happiness to hundreds of travelers passing through looking for a quick meal. But it left a permanent impression on one little boy, capturing his imagination in a way that nothing else had. One little boy named Billy. That was his nickname well, at least, Billy but his purple, parents liked bro. to call him William. William Afton. The bear could dance. It could sing. For decades, William dreamed of recreating that moment of bringing a musical bear to life, but how? William was smart, without a doubt, and he had a keen mind for business, but he wasn't the most creative. How do you make a singing, dancing bear come to life? The best he could do was using rudimentary costumes. William was inspired by the work of Walt Disney, who throughout the 50s Not and Walt. 60s was pioneering the use of mascot suits throughout his theme park. The big innovation? Suits with five fingers. This allowed the performers wearing the suits to use their natural arms and hands to interact with the guests. Facts. Ah, I got game. to pay the five. You're not ready for it. Let's get back to it. So As opposed to the older models where the arms would just hang his own by Disney. their sides. Finally, with a simple mascot suit, he would be able to realize his childhood dream. He would be able to bring Fred Bear to life. To appeal to the kids, and for copyright reasons, he changed Fred Bear from a realistic brown animal to a cartoonish yellow bear with a purple hat and bow tie. But feeling like one character wasn't enough, he added another friend. A yellow rabbit with a purple vest and matching tie named Bonnie the Bunny. While Fred Bear was Bonnie. certainly his first love, Bonnie was extra special because that was his. It was an original character that he had created from scratch. And I do mean scratch. William's hand-sewn costumes were rough with seams and stitches visibly showing, but it was the best that he could do. And you know what? It was just enough. Bonnie and Fred Bear would perform on stage to small but enthusiastic crowds. Finally, he was scary. able to deliver fantasy and fun to all the bit. kids, delighting and inspiring them in the exact way that he had been delighted and inspired so many years ago. And things could have ended there. That could have been the end to his story. It could have been perfect had it not been for one thing. Other people saw the success of his idea, and they wanted in. Enter Chica's Party World, a rival restaurant starring performing animal characters. His idea, except they did it better. William may have been the first, but obviously he wasn't the best. It hurt the prideful William Afton to admit it, but this restaurant was able to do the uh, thing that that's he just always what happens wanted in business to do. Make the general. animals actually come people. to life. All of the performers in this restaurant were robots, simple metal skeletons that were powered by battery what packs, but all of them able to free turn and talk and dance on their own huh? no human required it was like magic magic that came the from world. the mind of a brilliant creator Chuck e. Cheese henry type stuff, emily. Right? this henry in some small way had been able to harness the power of life itself afton admired him he was jealous to be sure but he also looked upon this man with awe off to one side of chica's party world was a small cabaret stage featuring an elephant magician on the other a hippo known to ramble on and on that one was more of a joke for the parents but it was the main stage that was for the kids a rocking band of characters featuring a yellow chicken thing with a southern drawl named Chica, backed by a band of other country-themed characters, bro. including a pig with a banjo, an upbeat frog from the local swimming hole, okay. and a brown bear with a heavy southern accent. Wait. A bear? But bears were his animals. Why not a cow or a horse? Something to fit the country theme a bit better. Why did it have to be a bear? And adding insult to injury, they had the nerve to call this thing Ned Bear, a direct copy of his own Fred Bear. Whoops, aye, that's aye, gonna aye. leave a mark. No, that was not okay. Afton's aye, jealous aye, aye. admiration turned to hardened bitterness. A bitterness that would only grow over the next couple of years as families continued to choose Chica's party world over Fred Bears. William just couldn't compete oh, yeah, with appeal of the robots. Eventually, his restaurant would go bankrupt, only to get bailed Jeez. out by, of course, Henry Emily. Another insult. Another humiliation that William wouldn't soon forget. 1979. Despite being bitter, Afton couldn't deny that what came next was a period of massive success and expansion. With the two franchises now merged into one, it was the best of both worlds. Afton's ideas with Henry's robotic expertise. The two men decided to launch under a new name, Fred Bear's Family Diner, a pizza chain that would eventually come to okay. feature a mix 
of humans in performing suits, as well as on-stage animatronics. They decided to stick with Fredbear as the headliner, considering the Yellow Bear was easily identifiable as a brand, and because he was the original performing animal mascot. The OG. Captain appreciated that. This new restaurant would also see a mix of characters as the two franchises merged into one, with Pig Patch and Happy Frog performing right alongside Fredbear and Bonnie. And, as part of this one big Fredbear family, they even got themselves official merch that were released, ranging from masks to magnets. The crappy Mr. Hippo fridge magnet? <sighs> That said, not all the characters were winners. The reception to some characters was just mediocre. So they faded away into the dumpster, storage aye units, aye and retro aye. budget tech stores of lost nostalgia, waiting for their chance to step back into the limelight if and when a headliner went out of commission. Others, though, would fare much better, like a new pirate fox, as well as a blue guitar playing variant of the yellow Bonnie Bunny. Ultimately, the franchise would get so big, it would spawn its own cartoon show, Fredbear and Friends. Business was booming. In the end, Fredbear and Bonnie's popularity would be so strong that they would be able to support the Fred Bear's Family Diner franchise all on their own, while also spinning off a new sister location dedicated to their friends. In 1983, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza launched, giving a dedicated home to all this new supporting cast of characters. Chica the Chicken, Bonnie the Blue Bunny, Foxy the Pirate, and of course the headliner, a brown Freddy Fazbear. Business was good, and Afton was happy, mostly. It did bother him that the one original character that he created, the one that he himself played, Golden Bonnie, got passed over for inclusion in that cartoon show. The only character in the roster of regulars to get ignored for the show, but other than that, things were going smoothly. He had himself a wife, two sons, a daughter, he had a thriving business, and best of all, he was able to learn the craft of robotics from the man that he both loved and hated, Henry. Together, they were constantly pushing the limits of what these characters could do. Because it was quick and easy, new characters introduced into the roster would be given a simple hand-sewn suit with five fingers that any performer could wear. Eventually, Henry would design one of his signature animatronics for that character, utilizing a divided mouth with either a hinged or sliding jaw design. This was the first generation of animatronics, but why stop? Bruh. Here's, here's my thing, brother. These, these characters ain't scaring the kids, brother. They got skin missing, they, the eyes are sliding off. Arms are sliding left and right. Stop there. Afton had big ideas. What if the animatronics weren't just locked to the stage, but could freely roam the restaurant and interact with the kids? What if his what? mascot suits could become animatronics? What if you could use more than just rigid metallic skeletons? Why not experiment with tubes and wires that would give the animatronics fluidity and flexibility while still providing structure? The possibilities for this technology were endless. Afton fell in love with robotics. He had started with a dream of bringing one simple singing bear to life, but with robots, so he had robot stumbled across the tools coming. that gave him the ability to control life itself. And thanks to Henry, he was practically speedrunning his way to an engineering degree. And while William wouldn't admit it out loud, one other thing that kept pushing him forward was the desire to beat his former rival. To prove himself smarter and more capable. To surpass the man <laughs> who childish. everyone else considered to be a visionary genius. But pride cometh before the fall, and tragedy was about to strike. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part one of the story. That said, at the end of each of these chunks, I want to break down some of the logical leaps that I made since the more narrative format doesn't give me much of a chance to justify a lot of the big decisions. And admittedly, there are some large leaps in here. Let's just start off with Fred Bear's singing show, shall we? We know, based on the retro poster that was hidden in Security Breach, that at okay. least at one point, Fred Bear was an actual bear. And like I called Thanks. out in that narrative segment, dancing bear shows were a real form of entertainment. The only okay. problem is that, timing-wise, none of our main characters would be the people in charge of that business in the 30s and a series of pizza restaurants in the 80s without him just being extremely old. Best case scenario, if Afton's running the singing show when he's 18, that still puts him at nearly 70 when the first pizzeria opens and his murder spree begins. That just doesn't make a lot of logical sense because he doesn't become immortal until his weird, first death in spring trap. That's why I suspect that Fred Bear's singing show was either a family business that Afton then carried on to a new generation or something that he saw as a kid and just wanted to recreate when he grew up. The Fred Bear singing show thing also starts laying the groundwork for some of the core 
core elements of this story, that Freddy's was a place of fantasy and fun, and that Afton, despite eventually falling to become the heartless serial killer and mad scientist that we know him as, began as someone with good intentions and a love of entertaining kids. He wanted to bring things to life from the very beginning, a theme that recurs a lot for him throughout the rest of the this franchise. Next up, let's talk about those mascot costumes. One thing that I keep going back to is the design of Glitch Trap. It's a handcrafted suit. You can see the seams and everything. It even has five fingers for the performer's hands. It is Which very is much weird. not a spring trap suit. This is something much more rudimentary. It came at a time before animatronics were a part of the story. That's why I suspect that it was actually the first, predating literally everything. It's also a suit that is very personal to Afton. He put his digital consciousness in that form. It's his personal avatar. It's the way that he sees himself. There's also a whole separate discussion to be had here about the habits and rituals of serial killers. So the fact that he's choosing to I'm lure sorry. kids and kill them in this particular suit actually says a lot about his emotional attachment to it. So while Wait, Fred what? Bear seems to have started as someone else's creation, Golden Bonnie was Wait. uniquely Williams, giving him a personal connection. How That's we not go? all. In this whole franchise, only one nice set of characters have themselves five fingers. In. The nightmare. To kill Even what? Golden Freddy, Fred Bear was a five-fingered wearable suit at one point in the story, as we see in this shot from the graphic novel, before he, like everyone else, was turned into an animatronic. This seems to imply that all of the main characters Yo. had similar wearable mascot outfits at least at one yeah, point in time, sure and that whoever is having the FNAF 4 nightmares, if they even are nightmares, something that we'll touch on in part two, saw those mascot suits specifically. Lastly, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. The literal elephant, Orville Elephant, as well as the rest of the mediocre melodies. For a while now, I've suspected that the mediocre melodies played a much more important role in the story than just being a bunch more animatronics to fill out the roster. Especially <sighs> Ned Bear, which is just so suspiciously close to Fred Bear. And yet, there are two key details that we're gonna have to justify with any mediocre melodies mention. One, they're very rudimentary with external battery packs, implying that they come very early in the timeline. And two, we know that, at minimum, Mr. Hippo does eventually become an official member of the extended Freddyverse. But if these things are supposed to be cheap, generic rip-offs, why would you be trying to rip off yourself? You wouldn't. You would be stealing someone else's ideas. So if Afton Thanks. created Fredbear, there would have to be some rival franchise. The only other person who would likely be ripping him off? Henry. We've talked extensively about how the mediocre melodies are clearly Henry's design aesthetic, so it just has to be him. I don't think Henry's doing this maliciously. He doesn't strike me as the type. He was likely building the robots at the orders of it's getting it's getting very complex i'm not gonna lie to you it's a lot going on in this i'm just trying to figure out so when someone else that was running a rival restaurant and... franchise but that's enough motivation to start afton down a path of jealous rivalry but also begrudging admiration as the freddy files ultimate edition says it's important to revisit the beginning of henry and william's relationship so here you go i think this is where it begins also this is future matt pat here coming back to add this one in seems like the recently released character encyclopedia has backed up all of this speculation i've had this timeline written for about a month now but i've also been holding off a bit to see what wrenches this character encyclopedia might throw in to it. And on this particular point, I gotta say, it seems like we might actually have nailed it. They actively call out the suspicious similarities to the main Fredbear crew. Quote from one of the pages, Ned Bear looks like an imitation, altered just enough to avoid copyright issues. I don't know about you, but that seems to imply that we were right on the money. Knowing all of this, at one point, the franchises had to have merged. That's really the only way that you get Mr. Hippo from the rival franchise as part of the Fazbear crew. This also mirrors a lot of what happened in the real life history of Chuck E. Cheese, said with that two earlier. rival restaurants each with their own casts of characters merging to become one unified brand. Again, we've gone into that in detail with other videos, just wanted to remind you all of that Wait, here. But she's why would problem? I call out the rival restaurant as being named Chica's Party World? Few things, actually. First, we know for a fact that a location named Chica's Party World exists. It is mentioned in the source code teasing sister location. So it is out there somewhere and doesn't fit cleanly anywhere. Second, in the story of the puppet carver, Chica is very explicitly looped in with the book versions of Pig Patch and Ned Bear, implying that she started as a mediocre melody. Thirdly, her design just fits better with a the theme of down home country animals with southern accents playing the banjo and eating with bibs. And with her being the headliner of the show with her name on the restaurant, it would make sense then that when the restaurants merged, she was the one that was added to the main cast of characters while all the other mediocres faded away. It's also why when Freddy's closes after William's killing spree, she's the one to branch back off into her old franchise and is therefore spree, missing in, in the sister world? location. Ha a detail that's what? bothered me for years what at this point. 
go it off might the also explain why William decided to stuff his first dead kid into Chica. That one was Wait Henry's creation, not what? his. What? Is all of this a big leap? Yeah. We're is it connecting a lot of dots that are end. very spread out across Come the out. franchise that I've been holding on into in the back Chuck of my mind animals, for years? Absolutely. But I think it Bro, makes sense. Doing? It also serves as a clean answer to a lot of the random threads that Scott's been leaving dangling for what? years. So, with all of that in mind, my friends, we can close the book on the foundation of Freddy's. And don't worry, next week I'll be back to give you arguably one of the most confusing parts of this entire timeline situation. Part 2, this The Afton confusing? Era. I promise, it will actually be next week this time. No more waiting around. I am just as eager to get this one out the door as you are to watch it. I promise. You know what else I promise? I promise that we'll actually get to talking about the games. I would have liked to have talked about them in this episode, but there just isn't that much in the games that helps us depict anything pre-Family Diner. Although, let's be honest, this franchise has never been just about the games what? anyway. What? Even back in the early days of FNAF, on. we were decoding images and source code that Scott fed us through the website. The modern yeah. day books and the clues that we get from those things now they're just modern they extensions of that all of this it is, is crucial to understanding this franchise what? and its lore unless of course steel wool finally gets around to making that fred bear's family diner game they want to make so badly i've always would love to do is get kind of back to i have no clue if we'll ever be able to do this but getting back to kind of like the origin of like fazbear entertainment or the mm. origin of of uh, Freddy Fazbear. But in the meantime, while we wait for that inevitably cryptic game, I hope that this start to the timeline helps to fill in some of those gaps. I'm excited to share part two with you next week. If you haven't subscribed and rang the bell, make sure you do it now so you're notified when that part drops. I cannot wait to see your thoughts down in the comments below. And as always, I remind you, it's all just a theory. A game theory. Go easy on me. Tried my best. Why are we stuffing kids? into robot animals i i need i need i'm i'm why so so why did the purple why did purple homie turn into a serial killer like at what point was it just so bad we just turned serial killer we just went we just went off the hinges what is going on what is going on it's a good start but i'm trying i'm trying to figure out why we it just got dark real quick in the middle and i'm just what is this? Huh? F and A F, what what do we what? There's, there's a lot of questions. Why are we stuffing kids in the robots? Like who who said that was a good idea? Who